strategy is an evolving strategy over time. We've been able to get those over 90%. And so this last year, we had a 98% student satisfaction rate. And so these are things we're very, we're very proud of. And it's very intentional and methodical on how we do things. Um, there is another reason why I'm here, and it's also for what you'll see soon, uh, a, a, an overwhelmingly shameless plug of a book I'm going to be publishing here in a month titled This, uh, this, this Same Thing. And so that's, that's, uh, that's why I'm here. And so through these several years, and teach, I've probably taught probably almost a little over 200 classes online before. And so over time, you know, and some of us have a lot of experience with this, over time you kind of start developing and evolving. And a huge part of it is your mindset. And I think what I see in this whole conference is a successful mindset for online education. And that is being willing to challenge yourself to improve every single time you go out there, to improve and get better and better and better. Never think that, that you have all the answers. And so the book I'm writing in this presentation is not about me having the answers and no one else having the answers. It's just, here's some of the things that have worked for me. Maybe you can try it too. And maybe it won't work for you. Maybe it will. So these are just ideas and starting points for you. I also have about uh, 20 five minutes to share all my secrets. So we'll see how far I can get in 25 minutes. Uh, so I, I kind of came to methodically thinking through, so what is it that brings an online program, and online classes together? What, what makes it successful? And so I, I came with a few, and so I may not be able to talk about all these things today, but there's essentially three pieces of the puzzle. And so maybe you are involved with one of those. Maybe you're involved with all of them. Maybe you're involved with a couple of them. But essentially, one big piece is the administration of the program. <coughs> and so whether that be for classes or for a program as a whole, this is a key component. And I include instructional design components in the overall administration and setup of the program. So included in these are developing a team approach. The number one way I find of setting up failure in classes is at many law schools when they just say, hey, instructor, go teach this class. Good luck. Then you're on your own. Have fun. And so this, this, uh, this project that I've been working on will certainly throw, hopefully, a lifeboat to the people in those situations. But it's also, hopefully, something you can bring to your administrators to show, hey, this is something we might want to look at to see that can work. So that's developing a team approach, having course uniformity across the board so that, there's not, so that students have a similar experience in one class to another. This is very important. Um, there's certain strategies you can do to successfully administer students. You need to have effective curriculum and retention strategies. Uh, I've heard this in a session earlier, but effective project management. How many instructional designers do we have in the room? One, two, three, four. Okay, so we have a few. So project management is a huge <coughs> part of any instructional design, isn't it? So and that includes any time you're doing anything with building an online course. You're going to need to manage yourself very effectively on how to get to things. Minimizing IT issues. Uh, this last year, my program had probably almost 100 students come through it in, in this last year. We had one help ticket the entire year and for, that, uh, for, for, that, for those students in all of their classes. And there are ways you can do that to minimize those issues. Uh, and a key part of minimizing IT issues is your orientation and how you orient both your students to the systems, but also the faculty to the systems. And so those are all very important. And then managing uh, outsourcing of functions. So there's lots of companies, you know, you can outsource instructional design or student services or different things. And so these, I, I talk about all these things, but of course I won't talk about any of those today because I only have 20 minutes left. So that's administering the program, very important part to having high uh, student satisfaction. Secondly, building your online courses. So whether you're a faculty member that's a JD that is just going to put one class online, or whether you're doing a whole program, you're going to conceptually separating the building of the course from the actual running of the course is, is very important and require different skill sets and many times different people who do those two, two functions. Uh, so the first thing I mentioned is UI flow. The bolded items is actually what I will talk about in the remaining 18 minutes. So there's uh, what I call UI flow, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, then successful asynchronous instruction. Uh, Jack Graves is here. He will be talking the second 30 minutes. He'll talk a lot about how you can do uh, asynchronous instruction successfully uh, in flipping a classroom. 
And so discussion forms. If I have time today, I'll talk a little bit about discussion forms and how you can make those very interactive and engaging. Assessments, we all know that that's an incredibly important part of any sort of education. Uh, so that's part of building a course as well. And effectively using both evaluations and data in improving your courses each time. And so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. And then finally, running a course, you can see some of the skill sets needed for that. So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, this, this is a part of this is, is shameless plug. So here's shameless plug number one for the, the book I'm writing. Each of those functions, I have one chapter devoted to each one where I build out each, each one of those functions and talk about them in detail. Uh, if you want to get a discount code for me, I don't, I don't know how much it is. They haven't told me. But if you email me, I can send you the discount code to the book to, to order it where I talk about each one of those items in detail. But uh, the main thing that I want to talk about today, I try to think, okay, what, what is it that I don't think anyone else is going to talk about here? Because, you know, lots of different topics, lots of different things that people want to discuss. And so I focused on, okay, wh one thing that's been big for me is five years ago, going back into the past, and I know many of us have had these experiences before, uh, five years ago or previously, if you did online education, you basically had to take outside technologies and adapt them to what you wanted to do in, in the online education setting. Today, it's a much different system. There's all these beautiful things that are being created specifically for education, which makes your life so much easier, so much easier now that we're experiencing now than in the past, and I suspect this will get much easier as time goes on. So, essentially what my book is about and what this presentation is about is not about specific systems. Oh, what's the, is this system better than that system or that system or that system? It's more about theories and processes that can be applied to any system. As long as you're using a good system for these different things, if you apply these things, you can achieve what you'd like in your, in your classes for high satisfaction rates. And so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of what my theories have been around. But the first, the first item there is called UI flow. Has, has anyone heard of UI flow before? So this is, uh, I had the, the joy of about, about five years ago actually, working for a Silicon Valley startup as an advisor. Tax is my expertise. That's what I teach in. And so they brought me on as a consultant. And so we designed an app. So we were designing an app on how to uh, do various things in the tax-related world. And so I got to experience this. And one of the things that they talked all the day long on was user interface flow. So user interface flow is simply the navigation of the students. And so when, if you have an app or a website, if you have something where someone comes and clicks on there and they have a negative experience, guess what? They're gone. They, they, they delete your app. They never come back to your website again. And so the user interface flow is a super key part of all technology companies in the billions inside Silicon Valley. Why aren't we thinking about this more in education? The People who are doing online things and spending billions of dollars are obsessed with user interface flow. But we in education are largely uh, ignoring it. So think like a Silicon Valley tech, up com uh, tech company. And so there are a couple of different strategies that you should focus on as far as looking at your data and things that will really have a big effect. Because if your students come in and can easily navigate right to the information they want without distractors, they will be happier students automatically. And you're setting yourself up for success in their learning. If they instead have to come in and have a very negative flow on how to find that information, you're going to block their, their uh, ease in learning the information. So drop rates is an important thing to look for. And you can see that data in your LMS if you, if you view the data there. And so you can see, did someone go to a certain page and drop off that page uh, within 20 seconds or so of being on that page. And if so, that page needs to be looked at or eliminated. And these are types of things that you can, you can look at as, as time goes on. And let, let me focus on my one key takeaway point from this section. And it's what I call uh, mental entry points. So mental entry points are essentially when a student comes to, a to your classroom, your online classroom. They're coming there for a purpose. They want to accomplish w a task when they're coming. So maybe it's, hey, I wanted to post in the discussion forum, so I'm going to go log in. 
Maybe it's, hey, I want to find the reading for this week. Maybe it's something else. So each class is going to be unique in what that will be. But each one of those is a mental entry point. They're, they're entering into your class to find something. And you need to make sure that they can navigate to that thing as quickly as is possible. Thus, if you have an online <coughs> class that has tabs on the left, or anywhere, depending on what LMS you're using, if you have more than, let's say, five, six, seven tabs on, as that main navigation feature, that's probably, you're probably on the, wrong, on the wrong track. So for example, in, in my program, these are the six initial navigation flow tabs that, that the students have. And we found that over time, initially I had eight, and then I found through the data that, okay, they aren't using two of them, delete, added one, testing data, see what works. This is what we've landed on. So for my program and my classes, these six tabs are why students come in and enter into the classroom. Thus, those are the first navigation features that the students see when they, when they enter. So if, if someone says, I need to log in to find the discussion forms, they come in, there it is, right in front of them, they click on it, and they go. If you have more than that, it starts to block, it starts to interfere. If you go to a, a restaurant, if you go to In-N-Out, I love In-N-Out, so if you go there, it's a super simple menu. I love it. I said, hey, cheeseburger. Bam. There it is. Done. If, you, if that menu was wrapped around the entire wall of the building, I might not like to go there because I'm never, I can never read the whole menu. I can't find what I want to find. So having mental, uh, analyzing your students in your class to see what their mental entry points are can be key to their initial success for the students inside the classroom. So that's it. See, I just, I just have to come in with quick hits here because I only have about uh, 10 minutes left. So number two is evalu evaluations. So this is something that Silicon Valley does very well, and sometimes people don't know how well they actually do this. And it is, it's just simply ask, asking questions. So how many people, how many people in your classes have uh, end of term surveys in, in your classes? Okay, great. How many people have um, mid midterm surveys in, in your classes? Good, good, good. How many people have more than two evaluations in inside your classes? Very nice, very nice, very nice. That's great. So essentially, uh, when I first started teaching online in the classes, I would survey the students obsessively. And I'm talking like multiple times a week, built into the class functions. One question there, one question there, one question there. And essentially I would, on my announcements to the students, I would say, hey, you know, this, you're, this is a brand new innovative class. I really want your help. Can you help me and, and provide me some feedback so I can help improve this? And they, by setting the tone for, by not saying complain to me, whine to me, oh boy, that, that, would, you know, that would be a nightmare, but instead involving them on your team to improve the class having lots of little surveys like that around can really give you valuable feedback as time goes on. So essentially, I teach the class time one. I get all this feedback on every little aspect. Was this reading helpful? Yeah, one through 10. Was, was that reading helpful? Was it, how, how relevant did you find this assignment? Qu questions like that. By the time I taught it the second time, I was able to improve. The time I taught it the third time, fourth time, <coughs> fifth time, sixth time, 20th time, by the 20th time, I'm not asking questions quite as much anymore because it's, you know, I'm hearing very similar things every time. And so it, it really, really helps. But uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, I have a two-year-old daughter. <coughs> and so she, she's great. I love her so much. This is us in Disneyland a, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, actually. And so she, the thing, how many of you, how many of you, have or had, have had young children in the house at some point, either now or in the past. One thing that I have certainly discovered is they are honest. They are very honest. So one night we, we were taking, I was giving, giving her a bath. This was a few weeks ago, actually. And, and, a, and, she's, and we're, we always talk. We're talking to each other. And she's looking at this, this block, this Duplo. And ha, I, these Duplos have little, little images of people on them. And she's hysterically laughing. And I, I go, Amy, what's, what's so funny? What's so funny? She goes, it's daddy. It's daddy. It's daddy. And I think, oh, there, 
that's got to be a picture of some strapping young fellow or, or something. That's got to be some really good-looking guy. Uh, this was the image of, of the picture there. Now, so, so, so my question to you would be, if you're not doing lots of evaluations, do you think your class looks like this? <laughs> the image looks better on my computer than, than up here, but the, do you think your class looks like this when in reality it looks like this? <laughs> but you won't know unless you ask, ask the students and ask them over and over again at, at various points. And so that's uh, the honesty of a two-year-old for you. And so similarly, the, the students can be very helpfully honest if you, if you frame it correctly uh, on a regular basis. So, that's, uh, that's my favorite thing. So, how, so, my, so then my question with evaluations then to you is, how often do you use evaluations? And so that's, that's something that I find very important. Does anyone have any points or questions that they want either about the user interface flow or about effective implementation of evaluations? Anyone want to make any points or questions? Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, so I struggle with this because I help design LMS Mm -hmm. sites for faculty and they all want their stuff on the left now and they all want to customize it. Um, and you're saying less is better, keep it simple, keep it to just what the students are looking for, right? But so the way to get to pare it down would be to put less things on the left now but when they click on it there's more things in there, right? But that means it's more clicking to get to where they want to go which is also a bad thing. So what, how do you deal with that trade-off? The, um, so there, there's, definitely, there's definitely theories on that. If, if I clicked, if that was clickable, so if I, I worded a course roadmap, and so the course, so the students is coming in to view, uh, they want the reading, they want, they want their assignment. And so how I do it is just call the course roadmap, and that's their click. On that click then, there's a huge, there's a navigation of basically the entire course. Week one, assignment one, week two, week three, assignment two, so on and so forth. So it's one click to get to everything. And so that's, that's the first flow in is nice and easy because the second that they click and get this huge navigation feature, oh, I just want the discussion forms, but then they're lost in all this information. And so if you get those initial mental, mental entry points, few and most key and important, then you can start to have more, more options for them. That's what I do at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. was, there, was there something over here? Yeah. So I'm intrigued by the thought of weekly evaluations in the course, and I guess... How, how do you frame that? Because I know you just mentioned, like, how do you find these readings helpful? What, what, what kinds of questions, I guess, do you ask to get the information that you want? To Great use? question. Uh, the, essentially, what, what is just as important as the right types of questions is the placement of where the surveys are. And so if, if, you, can, if you build in the surveys into the, the core structure, then it kind of, it eliminates a lot of necessary wording because it, it's obvious. So if, if you're asking about something, it's something that's right there in front of them. And so if you uh, essentially ask surveys that rank their satisfaction 1 through 10 and then have comments added to that, are, you're able to get some, some really good feedback. So for, for reading assignments, for example, it, it depends on if you're, if you're looking for, depends really what you want to know at that point. So if you have like a sixth a long reading assignment, you want to probably know like what was it effective, <coughs> how much of this did you actually read of the 60 page, like question, questions like that. And so you might want to um, ask, you might want to either ask two questions about that. So how effective do you find this reading? How much do you read? And then just have like one to <coughs> ten or you know just different options there. And so those are a couple different ways. You can also, uh, sometimes I would run A-B testing for it and so then have uh, es essentially have when if you teach a class over and over again and so I would ask one set of questions to an audience here but then a different set of questions to, to, the, to the audience there and so there's so there's lots of uh, fun ways to, to do that yeah pretty important though right yeah I saw some other hands did everyone surrender that, that easy oh yes yeah those are very nice metrics for sort of satisfaction and retention uh, could you talk a little about whether you know if your students are actually learning anything and so how or if you also design for that as well? I, I want to make sure that they're happy and not learning at all. <laughs> no, yeah, no, great. Yeah, great, great question. So a great way to, my, my favorite way to know if your students are learning is simply pre-test, post-test. And so having, having upfront 
on whether that be for the class or for a, or a week or something, having a pretest before they learn information compared to the post tests after, then that's a pr that alone is well, b besides the formative assessments and the summative assessments, things like that. Just doing a pretest can really indicate what they've learned. Did you want to further add on to that? I just love the skill that's integrated to your course inside your course book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit more about that. I can hear you. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah. So essentially, how I uh, how I do pre tests in in the system. So I, I just use we just use Blackboard, and and so through Blackboard or any other LMS, we just we essentially just have uh, the the first week. Uh, there's we we essentially have an introduction to the course. If 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 you cl once you click on course roadmap, the first one is introduction to the course, and then after that is week one, week two, week three, so on and so forth. And under introduction to the course is the pre the pre test for for the course. And so they'll click there, and one of the features that they'll see there is is the pre test for for the course. And so that that helps pre tests hope help immensely. Because I want to know my audience. I want to know what they're. I want to learn if I want to know if they learn. But I also want to know what they know already. And so if they, if they, because maybe in my tax class, maybe this has CPAs that have a zillion years of experience, and maybe they are advanced, and I can go more advanced as the class progresses. Or maybe this class has more entry level learners, and so I'll scale it back and focus on core fundamentals more. And so the pretest does both those things. It it, it proves learning, and then it also. Uh, gives you that information as the instructor so you can tailor the class to their needs. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? All right, great. So, yeah, that's, so that's one of the things. So, then third and finally uh, for the presentation was uh, discussion forms. And so earlier, I, I've heard throughout the day uh, effective use of uh, discussion forums. Yeah. And to me, and how we build our classes, discussion forums are one of the most important learning functions that you can do online. Because it, it allows the students to do two things. And this, both are huge for student satisfaction. It engages them on a regular basis with the program and other students. And build, can, if done effectively, can build community within your program, within your classes. And then secondly, it also helps them to enforce their learning on a regular weekly basis uh, in the classes. And so every time that I start with that, and if I'm in front of the faculty of my school or something, and I say, try out a discussion forum for a week, they'll immediately say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd done that, and no one posted, so I never did it again. And so that was like, oh, well, okay, yeah, that, that's fun. But uh, es essentially, the... Uh, it, for the classes that, that, that we run in our program, we have, let, let's say, if a class averages, let's just say, 10, 10 students, let's say we have 10 students, we will average between 60 to 70 discussion forum posts per week for those 10 students. And that's not like mandatory post seven posts each, it's just, there's, there, is, there are several ways to do it right, but the, I, I, know, I know one way to do it right, I know there's others, but I know one way to do it right. And this is a way to do discussion forums right and get lots of engagement and allow the students to write uh, very regularly uh, in the classes. So essentially the key to having successful discussion forum prompt, uh, discussion forums is what I call the initial prompt. So each week in every class we have our professors craft a scenario. And so depending on what the class is, obviously it'll be a little bit different. But let's say it's um, let's say it's a tax planning class, and let, let's say that um, so it's it's week one, and on that material, what I'll do in the discussion forum initial prompt, me as a professor, I'll write up a little client scenario, and give a little real world scenario action, and say this is their this is what they want to accomplish, this is how much income they have, this is their assets, give them some facts, then allow them to. Uh, on and then give them an initial, what we call the initial post. So every student has to post by the midweek point, has to post their initial post. And that is directly replying to the discussion prompt by the professor. And so that student then will outline their tax planning scenario for that week using the materials that they learned that week, citations and all that fun stuff in it, and they post their initial post. We put the settings in the discussion forums that they can't see anyone else's posts until they post the first time. 
then, so they can't be like, oh, okay, that's a good, I'll do that, I'll take that, and then, so they can't see anything until they post. Once they post, then, for the rest of the week, through Sunday, they reply to each other. So, this is also specifically prompted, and so the, the initial prompt will include, for your initial post, this. Say, uh, put a three-paragraph uh, planning on whatever. So, something specifically prompted and not too long. You don't want them to write essays. Then secondly, the second there, it says for your replies, you will uh, engage with uh, two other people in the forums and su suggest improvements on their planning or work with them to, to a more effective solution or, or something like that. So essentially they're replying to two, uh, at least two other people who post uh, for the rest of the week. And then they also need to respond to people who respond up to their own. And so, I, let's say I do, I do my initial post, click submit by Wednesday. Then, uh, the next day, two people reply to mine, then I need to reply to those, but I'm also responding to a couple other people. So, that, that leads for, they're using the material, they're using it directly, they're applying it. It's moderated in the sense that the, the instructors are always watching over and guiding discussions when necessary. And then they also get engaged and work with each other on a regular basis. I don't know about you all, but for my undergraduate and law degrees and things, re residential here, I, writing was, I, I never did weekly writing of any sort, unless it's like a legal writing class. I never really engaged with other students much in m maybe minimal group settings. This allows for engagement with other students on a weekly basis in, in and out all the time. So it was something we, that we've really found uh, great success in. Any questions, comments? Yes? Uh, um, what you found is a good um, point structure for your initial post and your reply post so that students don't figure out, oh, I don't need to participate in these because I've already got the grade that I want, so I'm going to skip this because it's not a point. It's not worth it. Ah, so great. Yeah, such a great question. Points, and there's actually a huge part of my book talks about points and strategies with points. I love using points because that's important, motivating the students to make sure they can't just ah, ignore this week. Uh, First off, general strategy is why have a class that's worth 100? This is just separate first, then I'll get exactly to that. But why have a, a class that's worth 100 points and to have, okay, this assignment this, this week is worth five points. Then like, ah, five points, big deal, even though that's 5% of the grade. Make the class worth 1,000 points. And now that assignment's worth 50 points. They're not going to ignore a 50-point assignment. They'll ignore a five-point assignment. They're not going to ignore a 50-point assignment even though, you know, it's the exact same thing. <laughs> so similarly here with discussion forum posts, and so uh, we, we have a set model where the discussion forums are worth 25% uh, of the grade overall in every class, mandatory, and essentially each, um, the, and so we have uh, eight-week classes, and so thus it's, it's a very substantive assignment in, in that regard. And so thus if you, if in the rubric that you post for the discussion forums, you just include, this is how many points, percentage, and if you make it a thousand point class, then it's not like a one point post. Instead, it's, it might be a 10 point post or a 15 point, and that starts, it's double digits, so they take it a little bit more seriously. But yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely something you want to look at at all times, otherwise, why would they post? Thanks, Brad. Yes? What's the professor's role at the end of this? Does the professor come in and do a summation post? Ah, or yes. Or they get as granular as responding to each student? There, there is, okay, so there's, uh, there's several ways I want to respond to that. So, so one is the importance of the separation of functions for classes. And so for, for, all, for online programs, so this, this doesn't apply to everyone because I know that many are, you know, faculty, JD, whatnot. But optimally speaking, having someone that builds out the, the, the course and the functions and doing all that, and then having a separate person be the one who's actually managing it, allows that person to get into much greater detail than the other person, because that person then can focus in on discussion forms as their main thing. But then, on a weekly basis, the, the professors, we call them course managers who, who manage the actual course, can go in and there's a rubric already set up in the system, and so they're just like doing the rubric and putting comments in each time. And so then they're able to look that students work as a whole that week and, and give them specific feedback on that. And so, you know, it, as time goes on throughout the class, you, you, some students are awesome and then you can do, spend less time, others spend more time improving their writing. But and, uh, a, feed, a lot of, if you disproportionately have your feedback at the front end, it pays dividends on the back end. And so then you can have less 
towards the end because they improve quickly, very quickly, with good feedback. Yes, anything else? Otherwise, time is up. All right, thanks, thanks so much, everyone, for that brief. And then finally, before I hand over to Jack, here's the last shameless plug, which is the exact same slide. It's that shameless plug number one. <laughs> Here for the quick change. Here you got the uh, the split the split presentation. And where I know you probably the uh, clicker. It's probably right in front of me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, there it is. No problem. Thank you. You got a better perspective is everything. All right. Well, I'm Jack Graves. Uh, I'm at Toro Law Center and the director of digital legal education, which you might say, what's that? Well, first of all, I kind of like the term digital education as opposed to distance education. And some of you in the last session uh, discovered I don't like that term. Um, and secondly, for us, it means two things. It means digital delivery of educational content. And it also means delivery of digital lawyering courses. So I, I actually wear two hats. One related in many ways, but one on, on, uh, on distance learning and one on new approaches to practicing law and delivering legal services. The focus today is on digital legal education as educational content delivered in a different way. And I like to start from the perspective, somebody raised this in the last session, I don't see her here, somebody from Chicago Kent pointed out the obvious, that most of us, I'm a doctrinal faculty member, in fact I was a tenured faculty member, but about three or four years ago I told my dean, I said I'll trade you my tenure if you give me a chance to, de to develop this area of digital legal education. I'm so confident that this is where it's going, I'll give you my tenure in exchange for you giving me some flexibility. She and I both think that was an incredible deal. I'm no longer tenured, but I'm a tenure track doctrinal faculty member. The, the point that was made earlier today is that most of us who are doctrinal faculty members in legal education don't know the first thing about, legal, about education. Something that my sister and brother and a lot, both of whom have their PhDs in education, can consistently remind me. <laughs> the first 10 years that I taught as a law professor, I did what almost all of us do. I mimicked what my professors had done. The reason I got the job was I graduated top of my class, I got a nice appellate federal clerkship, and I published an article that no one read except other law professors. <laughs> so, you know, classic group. About five years ago, I started getting, and, and I, I'm a tech guy. I was writing Fortran and COBOL back in 1970, to give you an idea. So, so I'm, I'm a tech geek from, from way back. But I started thinking, this, this is really going to change. The, the, the online, the online uh, distance learning uh, thing that some, you know, the MOOCs, a lot of people characterize as a fad. I started recognizing, this is really where it's going. And so I got interested in distance learning slash digital learning. And what was interesting to me is, in doing that, I started to learn to teach. It's not a lot to learn, but I think I started to learn to teach, and a lot of the things I learned in trying to first move to the video conferencing classroom, and then to the asynchronous classroom, if you want to call it a classroom, I learned a lot of things I could take back to my traditional classroom. And that's really the focus of what I want to talk about today. So when we think about, when we think about uh, the range of instructional methods from the traditional classroom to synchronous online to asynchronous, uh, I, I like to think of it as a continuum. And I think the move along the continuum from traditional to the state of the art is useful in thinking about how they differ. Um, for example, when we go from the traditional classroom to the synchronous classroom, the asynchronous, do we just change the modalities? I mean, there are a lot of people who still today believe, amazing number of people who still today believe, asynchronous education is where you do a video recording of your lecture in class and you create a back channel for chat questions. 
Now we've done asynchronous, asynchronous education because it's available 24-7, so it's asynchronous. Obviously, those of us who have done that know there's quite a bit more to it. Uh, you can't simply record classes and provide a back channel. Instead, what we've got to do with, particularly with asynchronous uh, delivery, is we've got to create a whole new, we've got to use a whole new set of tools, some of which we've had to create along the way, more and more of them are available today, but we've got to learn to employ those tools, and I think that brings up an interesting question. Might some of these tools be useful in the traditional classroom? So I think it's worth beginning with one example, this kind of transition from traditional to, uh, to asynchronous, with a course that I took on this transition, International Sales Law and Arbitration. This was a course I originally start, I developed it in 2003, where I was teaching at Stetson, uh, it combines international sales law, the doctrinal law of, of international sales tra transactions and goods, uh, and the law of, uh, governing international commercial arbitration. It combines the two. Um, and this isn't me, uh, but, but it's just, just a picture I found of the traditional classroom. I taught this, I taught this in a traditional classroom for about 10 years. Um, and one of the things I think, one of the reasons I like this picture is because we've got a bunch of people, notice, with laptops. And it's a pretty easy transition to imagine from a large classroom with over half the people sitting in front of their laptops to this. Everybody sitting in front of their laptops and attending class through the webcams on their laptops and desktop computer. So what I did about four years ago, four or five years ago now, time starts to blur, uh, the, uh, four or five years ago, is I took my traditional cl uh, class in international sales law and arbitration and I took it online using video conferencing. Uh, I've actually done this using Adobe Connect, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, Adobe Connect with, uh, uh, with Vantage Point, which is amazing, but it's really expensive, and more recently Zoom, but they all kind of give you the same thing. They give you something that, that um, gets rid of the geographic distance between you and your students. It brings everybody to the same virtual space at the same time. And so it's a little bit, you know, it's a little tricky getting used to this. You've got to teach sitting down. I hate sitting down. Uh, but other than things like having to teach sitting down instead of standing up and, and learning to work the controls on your computer, you know, it's pretty much like teaching in the traditional classroom. Now, this, my focus is on taking what we learned from asynchronous uh, and, and bringing it back to the traditional classroom. But this actually has some great things we can use in the traditional classroom, too. I do all my exam reviews on Zoom. It's crazy during the finals period to bring your students into the, into the school. Most of us don't want to go there. So I do all of them on Zoom, and then, of course, I can record them. I do extended office hours on Zoom. Uh, I have a, a couple of extra Zoom licenses that I let students use for study groups. I've got students who convert, commute from New Jersey to the center of Long Island. They don't, you know, they can't make it work. So, so there's still there's a, there's a lot of great uses for synchronous beyond just synchronous classes. But then I took the third step, and the one that I think really is the biggest the biggest change for those of us who started teaching, particularly doctrinal courses in traditional classrooms. I did this in collaboration with Aspen Iowa. Uh, I know there's at least one person, maybe the am not sure if Mike's here, there's, there's one or two people here from Aspen Iowa. Uh, I had started working with them a few years ago. Actually, I met uh, Aaron uh, at this, no, it wasn't this conference. It was a, a different conference in, uh, uh, up in Minnesota. But anyway, the, the, Wiggle, the original Wiggle Doobie conference in Minnesota. But here you see my classroom. The asynchronous classroom, on, in this case, Brightspace D2L, uh, where the student logs on 24-7, uh, meets me, gets the welcome, goes to the course cont content. In this case, it also includes the digital textbook because I wrote the text and I got the copyright back from, uh, from Aspen. So uh, this one-stop shop, it's all there for the student. So when I took this final step from synchronous to asynchronous, I was really curious, does this really work? When I had moved from the traditional classroom to synchronous, I was pretty confident it was working. I was seeing the same kind of student performance both in class and on assessments. I was getting a little better teaching the course. You teach up over and over, you get a little bit better. And I was pretty sure I was getting good content or, or getting good performance out of the students by synchronous class. But 
Who's this going to work in this online, go on 24-7, asynchronous world? So I took an exam I had used about three years earlier and never released. It's 90-minute essay question, so there's a lot to it. Um, I hadn't been, you know, nobody had confident that none of my students had access to it. I reused the same exam hypo and the same rubric. And so this comparison was not between traditional classroom. This comparison was between synchronous and asynchronous. But I'm convinced that the synchronous didn't differ much for the traditional classroom. The asynchronous delivery method improved performance across the board from top to bottom. At the top was 7%. This was 27 students, by the way. 26 one year and 27 another year. So I didn't get the magical 30 that you'd like to have for statistical validation, but not a bad, not a bad data set. Here we see the numbers. The mean was up 32%. The median was up 35%. And the bottom was up 125%. Now, admittedly, at the bottom of the class, we're dealing with outliers. So maybe the 125% number <coughs> is not as valid as the rest. But the mean and median were pretty surprising to me. Surprising sort of. I, expect, I actually expected it to be as good or better. I didn't expect it to be a third better. So I started asking myself, why did this happen? You know, how did is, is, you know, is, is D2L a better teacher than I am? Maybe. In looking at this, I boiled it down what I thought were three potential factors that drove the improvement. I also went back and I just reread uh, all, of the, uh, all of the essays from the students. And the quality was genuinely better. One of them is, more effective information transfer. We'll talk about that. In many ways, the videos, I created 152 videos averaging seven and a half minutes apiece for this course, and in many ways my videos are better than me in person. <laughs> Secondly, better and broader interactive participation in applying the information that have been transferred. Once the student, you've transferred the information, assuming you're effective, what do the students do with it? Well, you've heard about discussion boards. The, the, the quality of the discussion and the discussion boards in this class was better than I ever get in a real class, where it's brutal to even get students to talk. And personally, I weigh in occasionally, but not all that much. I don't need, I only weigh in when the students get off track. They don't need me. And I use more frequent scored formative assessments. I have a reputation, and students at first hate it, and then they get to the final, and they love it. And my, in the classroom, in the bricks and mortar classroom, contracts one and two classes, I give five assessments during the semester that count for 50% of the score. The final, which by the way isn't summative because students stick around and hear the answer right after the exam, so even the final is formative. Um, the final is 50%. Now, I used that same percentage online, but I did 10 scored assessments. There are 10 modules over 12 weeks. At the end of every module, they get a scored assessment. So, of course, at first, the students were kind of bummed. They're going, God, we're always doing a test, particularly this summer where they're doing it in six weeks. But they also figure out when they get to the final, you know what, I know this stuff pretty well. So, assuming that some combination of these three factors drove the improvement, how do we take these into the traditional classroom? And for that, we need to talk about the flipped classroom model. How many of you who teach believe you are using a flipped classroom model? And it means different things to different people. That's why I want to ask. Good. We got to get... This is from the University of Texas. I think it's a pretty good representation. In the flipped classroom model, in the, the students prepare before class. You might say, well, my students do that. They read cases. Of course, they have no idea what they're reading or why, and they come to class as confused as ever. The idea is they actually pre prepare and learn the doctrine, the materials that they're going to need to do their homework in class. They learn it before class. And we'll talk a little more about this, but we all know that many, if not most of us, gain better, you know, are, are, are better at receiving transferred information through multimodal mode modes, or through multimodality. A good example is, has anybody read Barbara Oakley's A Mind for Numbers? 
it's a, it's a great book. It's a great book. You know, all the good stuff on uh, evidence-based education all comes out of STEM, uh, science and technology, which maybe in, as legal educators, we ought to go back to Langdell and go, Langdell said that this was really kind of like a science, so if we could actually start teaching it like a science, we'd probably be better teachers. Anyway, um, I read that book, and I'm pretty good at reading and understanding and retaining. But I recently had occasion to go watch Barbara Oakley's MOOC on learning how to learn. And in her MOOC on learning how to learn, I recommend it, four weeks, very easy, it's on Coursera. Um, all she does is cover the same stuff that was in the book. And I learned a bunch of stuff I hadn't learned from the book. So the point is that when we talk about a real flipped classroom, we're not just talking about reading. I like videos, it could be videos, it could be, uh, it could be games, it could be any number of things, but something that's interactive and engaging more than just reading a book. Then the students come to class where they do their homework. They actually do the work, they apply what they learn. And then it doesn't stop there. It's not just, okay, I'll go write up my outline after class. They keep applying what they learn after class. So the flipped classroom model involves information transfer out of class, putting it to use in class, and continuing to put it to use after class. There's, you can Google Eric Mazur on peer, uh, uh, peer learning, uh, yeah, peer learning. So he's a Harvard physics professor. Again, the people in STEM are ahead of us on this stuff. But he describes it really well, so I'll use his term. Traditional lecture is all about information transfer. And the problem is, transferring information in one direction is a lousy use of class time, which we can do a lot more with interactively. In addition, it's not even particularly effective. Information is better transferred before class asynchronously. I'm increasingly convinced of this. Reading is useful, and, and we should abandon reading. But it's of limited value. It's, better, it's of greater value in setting up the richer medium of video. And again, we can talk about video or other interactive means. I like video. There's a lot of different ways you can do this, but here's the key. You can make the speed and playback personalized. You meet the learner where he or she is. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. Some people are going to want to watch at bell speed, some people at half speed, because you're taking it in and learning at different speeds. You miss something. You, how many of you can listen for 40 minutes or 50 minutes nonstop without ever kind of drifting off? None of us. If you drift it off, you're done. You lost it. Or the student says, could you tell me what you just said again, please? That doesn't really help with the information transfer for everybody else. On video, you stop it, you go back to what you missed. Or you stop it and you think about it. You also can embed a uh, question. You can randomly access it any time. You know, what did he say last week? You can go to your notes, and which may be a good thing. Or you can go access the information at any time. That's the reason you want to use nice short videos. You can embed assessment in the videos themselves. Every student is getting assessed along the way. What did you just read? Did you get it? If, if, for in your law schools, ideally, if you've got access to an LM, to a full LMS, great. I don't in my school. I do this with twin. I post videos on. There's a lot. Of, twin is not as good as Whiteboard or D2L or Canvas, but it works. I use the sequence. They read something, they watch a video with embedded questions, then they do problems. I actually wrote an uncased book in contracts. If you're interested, I'll do my own shameless plug. I'll talk to you about learning contracts. I think the case method is a disaster. Um, but whether you're teaching them through problem method or through case method, they do some of it, but only in preparation for class. And they do it after you've explained the rule. Not while well, they're trying to figure out the rule and brief the case at the same time, as if, and, and of course, what they all do is they go to study it, which we don't want them to. Your videos are your study aid. In my first, in my contracts class, every single class has one or two videos that the students watch in conjunction with the reading. Then, 
we go to class, which Eric Mazur calls making sense of the information. Now, I'm just going to give you a few examples because we can do a whole conference on formative assessment in the classroom. In fact, I went to one at Emory, the uh, Institute for Law, Teaching, and Learning, did a conference at Emory in, I think it was March, uh, just on formative assessment in large classes. The point is, this is a bigger subject that I can get into today. But Jason was talking about, uh, about um, evaluation, meeting the student where they are. Start the class with an intro quiz. If you've taught them something before class, because you've done all the inter information transfer before class, you've got a basis for figuring out, did they get it? If you've got to backfill a little lecture, you do it then, but you know where your students are at the beginning of class. Then peer-to-peer -peer instruction and team exercises. You're, again, you're engaging the whole class in a way that's similar to an online bulletin board poster. The key is you're engaging every single student interactively, which is analogous to the asynchronous environment and very different from the one or two students that you're grilling in the class into the traditional or even the kinder, gentler version that most of us practice the Socratic method. And then, once again, how are we doing? Exit polling. What did you learn today? What did you take away? I use Socrative. There's lots of different ones out there. Uh, entry, you know, intro quizzes, exit polling. The intro quizzes, you leave them up. They can take them over and over. I tell them, if you, if any quiz I post, if you don't do it over and over and over and over again until you get all the questions right, you're crazy. And most of them know it. And the key is, you have time to do all of this because you moved the lecture out of the classroom. And by the way, you did it more effectively because it's more effective asynchronously than in class. And then after class, more retrieval practice. Evidence-based learning suggests that's, that's where it starts to stick. Uh, and the learning continues after class just as it does with asynchronous delivery. Uh, in this case, includes scored assessment. Take the quizzing function out of the classroom. This is what I'm about to do this year, and I've really struggled with it. Somebody brought up the cheating issue. Right now, even though I do multiple assessments during the semester, I always struggle because I'm devoting class time for those assessments. I do, I, we immediately review them. I try to turn them into learning exercises, and so I feel, you know, I, I'm okay. But boy, I hate to give up the class time for that. If I'm going to go to something like I'm doing in my asynchronous class, twin scored, 10, 10 scored assessments in a semester, I'm going to have to find the time. I think I'm about to take my quizzing function out of the classroom and put it online. My experience with the asynchronous course convinced me that whatever cheating may go on, and I'm not an idiot, there may be some, and in fact there is in the classroom, for once in a while we, we, we learn that it is, and I'm sure there's some instances where we don't learn about it, but I think it's outweighed by the value of more and more frequent formative assessment that lets, that, whether it's in the form of multiple choice questions with here's the answer and here's the explanation, uh, or essay questions, we'll come back to those in a moment, and the feedback that goes with them, feedback to the student, how are you doing, and feedback to me, how am I doing? Are we getting, uh, am, am I getting across what I think I'm? Am I achieving my learning objectives? Now, multiple choice questions are easy. We can do a lot of those as long as we can find the time to do it. And of course, the students at first say, oh my God, you're assessing us to death until they get to the final and then they love you for it because they realize they actually learned it all. Uh, <laughs> and they're not cramming for the final. But essays are particularly tricky for law professors. You know, they got to grade them. All of us get, writing, you know, everybody says, writing good multiple choice questions is hard, but they're really easy to grade. And the great thing about them is, if I've got 50 multiple choice questions in a given subject area and I let my students see them in advance and I pull 10 of them and put them on the exam, I'll still get a good bell curve out of it because as long as it's closed book, uh, the fact that they've seen them before doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that they know them all, and it also encourages them to look at So multiple choice is pretty easy to do this way. Essays are harder. The essays are easy to write and hard to grade. One of the things that I'm looking at, there's a group of us from, uh, from uh, multiple institutions that are looking, um, is, is peer scoring of written work. 
Now, some of you, I know my colleague uh, Ann was doing this long ago at the uh, uh, University of Phoenix. <coughs> the problem is, conceptually, peer scoring of student work is great because you can do more assessment of written work through the students than one professor or even one professor and a bunch of TAs can ever do. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, you know, the student's evaluations, can we really use this as part of a grade? The student evaluations can be haphazard. So there are at least that I know of four platforms that are out there right now that have developed, depending on what, what, what you believe, have developed or are developing an algorithm that essentially as long as you have four or five students evaluate each peer's work, um, you get scoring that is as good or better in terms of consistency and validity as with the faculty. And here's the bonus. It's not just that the students are doing your work for you and scoring each other. They're learning. Think about how much they learn when they score each other's uh, written essays. So I say that's in progress. There's, if you're interested, there's a look at Peerceptive. It's P-E-E-R-C-E-P-T-I-V. Dot com. Again, came out of STEM, it was developed by a, a group of uh, uh, science, science teachers, science and engineering teachers at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, there's a group of four of us from four different schools, so five of us actually, two of us from four, oh, and three from uh, three of the schools that are looking at trying to develop a standard set of, uh, a standard set of templates for using this to assess IRAC law school essays. The point is, the tools are there for us to be able to do uh, to do much more in the way of scored assessment along the way, just like we do in various forms in an asynchronous course. Um, provides regular feedback to the students and the instructors. So again, in summary, how do we flip and improve the traditional classroom? With more effective information transfer, and I would argue that in general, if all we're doing is transferring information, it's better done outside of the classroom in an asynchronous setting. Then we've got better and broader interactive participation in applying that information in the class that was previously transferred in the classroom. Because everybody comes to class ready to work together, ready to do their homework, with you there as the proverbial coach on the side. Not if you want to be the sage on the same stage, fine, you can still do that, but you do it up here in your videos while you're transferring the information, not in the class. The classroom ought to be all about the students. And then lastly, more formative assessment afterwards, a particular more scored formative assessment, providing regular feedback. Believe it or not, as a law school professor, at least three times a semester, I tell my students, if the course ended today, this is your grade. That gets their attention. <laughs> in a way that raw scores or you're doing good or you could do better, none of that. When you tell them, if the course ends today, you've got a C minus. Or when the course ends, if the course ends today, you're failing. That gets their attention. And you can do that if you're doing a lot of scored formative assessment along the way. Sorry, I apologize. I'm probably out of time. I've got my two minutes. Any questions? I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. The, Putting us in the two in, in the double slot uh, jammed us for time. I'm going to actually make two comments. Sure. First of all, one will talk. You're about very you're very substantially ahead of everybody else I've seen at this conference, which is wonderful. One correction, students don't actually learn more from video than from lecture or from reading. All of those are rules of passive learning. The place where you're seeing the uh, learning games coming from is the frequent form of assessment you put into that. If you're putting the same questions within a reading, or if you're putting clickers in a classroom and give students, you know, sort of the error to observe your instruction, you will see very similar learning points. The second comment is just a very good bit of nuance on uh, peer review. Peer review works well in a very specific set of contexts. If students have a clear rubric and well-defined criteria, you can make it be as, as, as effective as instructive writing. It breaks down a lot of areas that are very relevant to legal education, where there's a lot of professional conventions that teach us students are not qualified to know. I can maybe offline give you a lot of references on where it just and doesn't work, but you can be very careful to find it to keep it within those domains. And I completely agree with you on the period grade, which is why we're working as a group to try to come up with a template for rubrics, because you're right. The problem is most 
doctrinal law professors in particular don't understand how to grade well enough to be able to teach their students how to grade properly. And that's a problem. So you're right. You've got to provide the mechanism. You've got to provide the mechanism so that the students understand what is expected. Totally agree with you. We should talk more because I'm less convinced that, lect that, I can, that I can teach as effectively lecturing in a classroom as I can delivering that same lecture on videos. Well, we should, we